Well, the question is often asked, why do we do good deeds? You know, some people think that we do good deeds in order to be saved. As a matter of fact, JB, our senior pastor, he even thought that at one point in time until someone set him down and told him the truth of the gospel, how the wages of sin is not doing good, but the wages of sin is death. And that Jesus Christ paid the price. He died on the cross paying for his sins, your sins, my sins, the sins of the entire world. He rose from the grave conquering death. And that whosoever believes in him can have everlasting life. Some people think that once you're saved that you have to do good deeds in order to stay saved. Or in order to know that you're saved. Or that maybe you'll lose your salvation if you don't do good deeds. Well, the book of Titus is filled with good deeds. It tells us that we as Christians are to live godly lives. But nowhere in the book does he tell us that we do good deeds in order to be saved or in order to stay saved. He tells us as those who have believed God that we are to do good deeds because they're good and profitable for men. And that's what we're going to see this morning in our passage We're going to get some background and we're going to flow into the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning, which is Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 8. In verses 4 through 7, we're going to see good deeds. They're not for salvation. And then in verses, in verse 8, we're going to see that salvation or that good deeds are profitable for all people. So let's begin by getting some background and flow into our passage. This book is a letter written by Paul to Titus. And he calls Titus in chapter 1, verse 4, he calls Titus his true child in a common faith. So he is a child in a common faith. Many people believe that Paul led Titus to faith in Jesus Christ, that he gave him the good news message of Jesus Christ, and Titus believed in Christ at that point in time. But he didn't do like many people do. He didn't just leave him there. He continued to disciple him. He continued to train him in the truth and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his word. But he didn't just do that. He lived life with him. He taught him how to do ministry. And that's what we are left here to do. We are to be disciples of Jesus Christ, which means we are to lead other people to faith in Jesus Christ, giving them the good news message. And then we are to continue to disciple, to train them so that they are ready to do ministry themselves. Well, Paul got Titus to the point in time that he was mature enough that he thought he could leave him on the island of Crete to do ministry himself. And that's what this letter is. It's a letter to Titus from Paul and he's telling him what he is to do while he's there. And so he's telling them, he's giving them instructions on selecting elders, dealing with false teaching, having purity in doctrine. How are we to live as Christians in the body of Christ with other believers? How are we to live outside the the church? And that's what he's talking about in the section that we're going to be dealing with this morning, is how are we as believers to deal with those outside of the church? Because the truth is, many times we live differently inside the church than we do out there in the world, do we not? We come into this place, into the four walls of this church, and we say, hey now, you don't cuss in here, you don't cheat in here, we don't lie in here, we don't steal in here, because where are we? We're in church. But we're not supposed to act any differently out there than we do in here. We should live like we live in here out there in the world. And that's what we're going to see that Paul tells Titus to remind the church, the believers, of how they are to live in the passage that we're going to see this morning. We know that God desires for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. He tells Timothy that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. And then also, we've seen it in the book of Jonah that God loves all people. He's left us here for a purpose. It's not just get to heaven and everything is good. We are to get to heaven by faith alone and Christ alone. But he's left us here to do good deeds so that we can share the message, the good news message of the gospel with those who are lost and fallen in this world. Then in chapter 2, towards the end, he gets to another great theme that is found throughout the Bible, and that is grace. Whenever we understand the grace of God, it should promote us, it should invoke us, 
to do good deeds for other people. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, we see that salvation is based on the grace of God. It's all the grace of God. We don't deserve to have an eternal relationship with the Almighty Father based on our deeds, on our works, on our lifestyle. But it's the grace of God that we are saved and saved forever. It's the grace of God that we live the Christian life. It's not a set of rules. We have our freedom in Christ. Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Living the Christian life is not a bunch of rules and regulations. We have our freedom. It's the grace of Christ that we live out the Christian life. It's the grace of God, based on the grace of God, that Christ one day will return for us. He'll come in the clouds and He'll take us all the way to be with Him. And I can't wait for that day because we're going to see in this passage that we have a great inheritance that's waiting for us, for those of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ. And it's the grace of God that He's coming back for us. And it's the grace of God that Jesus Christ died his resurrection. He's redeeming us as a people for his own possession who are to be zealous, excited to do good works. Now in chapter 3, Paul tells Titus, he says, remind these believers that they are to live as believers in Christ. It's a godly life, a life filled with good deeds. Even more specifically, as I said, how do we live as believers in this lost and fallen world as we scatter in this community? He's left us here to give the good news message of Jesus Christ. Well, whenever Paul Paul gets to writing Titus chapter 3, in verses 1 and 2, we'll get a lead-in to the passage that we're going to be focusing on this morning. Paul tells Titus to remind them. He tells Titus to remind them, that is the church, that's you who are here today. Anyone who's put your faith in Jesus Christ, he says, remind them of these things. So what I'm talking about this morning is definitely applicable to each and every one who is here, who's put their faith in Jesus Christ. Look with me at Titus chapter 3 verse 1. He says, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. So basically, he tells them that we are to obey the world's rules. The world has rules, and we are to obey them. Whenever it says the speed limit is 65 miles per hour, we are to obey that. Whenever that big red sign says STOP on it, we are to stop. We are to obey the rules of this world as long as they do not go contrary to the Word of God. We're to be ready to do good deeds. You know, people are in awe whenever you do good deeds for them out of the blue. Whenever we do good deeds for people that we don't even know, they wonder, why did you do that? Whenever we do good deeds for people for no reason at all, our family, our friends, those who live around us, they wonder, well, why did you do that? And we can tell them that it's because of the grace of God, because God has been grace. Gracious to me, I am being gracious to you. I'm giving back to you. And it opens up the opportunity to share the good news message of Jesus Christ with other people. We are to go out of our way to be at peace with all people. Romans 12, 18 says, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. We live in a world that's hostile, that always is thinking about themselves, and they're not looking at others. And As believers in Christ, we are to be finding ways to be at peace with all people. That's the way we are to live in this world. Why? Because the people in this world are like what we used to be. And that's what he says in verse 3. Look with me at verse 3. It says, For we also, that's Paul including himself, including Titus, and the church, he says, For we also once we're foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. There was a time when we were enslaved to all these things as well, before we put our faith in Jesus Christ, before we had the Holy Spirit who comes to live inside of us, to empower us, to renew us to this new life, to regenerate us, to make us born again, all of these things we'll see in our passage this morning, how the Holy Spirit makes us alive, how He makes us new creations in Christ. We were once like them, but now there's been a change. 
And that gets us to the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. In verses 4 through 7, we're going to see that it's not our good deeds that save us. It's the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Whenever we're talking to people out in the world, we need to understand that it's not about us. We're not to be talking about us and how good we are. We're not to be talking about the other people, those who haven't put their faith in Christ, who are living a wild or a a different lifestyle. It's not about them and how they're living their lifestyle and how they are to change. It's about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it's not about us. It's not about them. It's about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As we look at these next four verses, I want to point out a few key words as well. They are grace, mercy, and love. Grace is, is us getting what we do not deserve. We don't deserve eternal life, eternal relationship with the Almighty God, but He graciously gives it to us. What do we deserve? We deserve what Jesus Christ got. We deserve the beating, the lashes, the cross, but Jesus Christ... God, in His mercy, He doesn't give us what we deserve. He poured out His wrath on Jesus Christ. He paid the penalty that we couldn't afford to pay. He did the good deed it took in order for us to have eternal life. And love is the motivation behind God's grace and God's mercy. So listen for those words as we go through. But let's see what Paul says. In verses 4 through 7, he says, Good deeds, they're not for salvation. In Titus chapter 3 verse 4 it says, but when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared. This verse begins with but, contrasting to what we were like in verse 3 to what we are like now and it's all because of God our Savior. Notice here Paul calls God our Savior and God is our Savior. It's God who came up with the plan to send the Son into the world. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God is the Savior in sending His Son. And love is the motivation behind God sending His Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Galatians 4, 4 says, But in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. God is the one who came up with a plan back in Genesis chapter 3 that he was going to send someone who was going to crush the head of the serpent. God came up with a plan. God is our Savior. And John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That God, that, that Jesus, that God sent into the world, His Son, He became flesh and dwelt among us. He lives with us. Look on with me to verse 5. It says, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Notice how this verse starts. It says, He saved us, not we saved ourselves. He saved us. We weren't the ones seeking after God. Isaiah 53, 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We can't save ourselves. He goes on and clarifies not by the deeds which you have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. We are not the saviors. God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are the ones who save us. There is no one righteous, no, not one. Our good deeds are nothing but filthy rags before our Savior. We can't save ourselves by the way that we act, by the way that we live. He's always the Savior. And the Bible tells us how we can be saved, and it's always by faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not as a result of works. It's not your deeds that you do in righteousness. It's not of works so that no one may boast. Romans 4, 5, But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited. As righteousness. Galatians 2.16. We've just went through the book of Galatians last semester. And Galatians 2.16 says. Nevertheless knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. But through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus. So we may be justified by faith in Christ. 
and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. He saved us. He is the Savior. He is the reason that we have eternal life. It's not what we have done, what we are doing, or what we will do that saves us. He saves us. He is the Savior, not us. It's not our deeds that we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. As I said earlier, mercy is not getting what we deserve. Remember what we were like back in verse 3? And many of us still live lives that portray some of those things. Do we deserve what God gives us? No, but out of His mercy, He gives us what we don't deserve. He doesn't give us what we do deserve. It goes on in the end of verse 5, and it tells us what the Holy Spirit does. Look at the end of verse 5. It says, By the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Notice there's three things here. There's washing, regeneration, and renewing. Washing means to be made clean. We are made clean. It goes back to Romans 4, 5. But to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. God makes us righteous. He gives us his righteousness. We are made clean at the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ. He also regenerates us. He makes us alive. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus whenever he came to him? He said, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Nicodemus says, what's that mean? How can I go back up into my mother's womb and come back out again? He says, you're the teacher and you don't understand these things? I'm not talking about physical birth. I'm talking about spiritual birth. We come into this world physically alive, but we come into this world spiritually dead. If we want to be with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for all eternity, we have to be born again. We have to be made spiritually alive. And the Holy Spirit does that for us at the point in time that we believe in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 talks about this. And again, you hear the words grace, love, and mercy in these two verses. In Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 it says, But God, being rich in His mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, He made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. It's all of God's grace, love, and mercy. He brings us from death to life. He regenerates us. The Holy Spirit does that. And then finally, He renews us. He makes us new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We are made new creations in Christ. And that's why we are to live like who we are rather than who we used to be back like we saw in verse 3. Because we're new creations in Christ, we are to be living as the body of Christ. We are to be living godly lives. We are to be doing good deeds because we understand what all God has done for us. So we've seen the Father's role in saving us as He is the Savior in that He sent His Son. We have seen the Holy Spirit's role in washing, regeneration, and renewing. Now let's see the Son's role in verse 6. In verse 6 it says, Whom He poured out upon us richly, Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Notice here he calls Jesus Christ our Savior. Just as God the Father is our Savior, so too is Jesus Christ. Because the truth is, without Christ's work on the cross, we would all be dead in our trespasses and sins. But what did Jesus Christ do? He came at the right point in time. In Philippians 2, it says he humbled himself. He humbled himself to become a man and to live with fallen people. He humbled himself to the point of death, even the death on the cross. He bore in his body our sins on the cross. He paid the price we couldn't afford to pay. He did the good deed it took in order for us to have everlasting life. Look back up a few verses to Titus 2.14. He says, He gave himself for us to redeem us From every lawless deed. He paid the price for us. Our sins are completely gone. Because Jesus Christ paid the price. 
But the good news is, is that he didn't stay in the grave. Three days later, he arose from the grave, conquering death. And that's how he can give us life, because he's conquered death. And whoever believes in him gets everlasting life. So if you're sitting here today and you've thought that your goodness, your righteousness was the way that you got eternal life and you look at your life and you say, man, how could I ever measure up? I do way more sins than I do good deeds. I have some good news for you. You're not the Savior. Jesus Christ is the Savior. He paid the price. He did the good deed it took in order for you to have eternal life. And if you simply just believe in Him, He gives you as a gift everlasting life. An everlasting relationship that that starts at the moment you believe in Him. He is the Savior, not us. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He didn't say, I am a way, or I'm part of the way. He said, I am the way. It's not us doing our part and Him doing His part that saves us. Jesus is the Savior, not us. Acts 4.12, for there is salvation and no one else, for there is no other name given among men by which you must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. He is the Savior, not us. So what are some benefits that we get because of the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? We're going to see there's three things. We're justified, we're heirs, and we get eternal life. Look at verse 7. So that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So that, purpose statement, so that being justified by His grace, we're first, we are justified. That means to be declared righteous. If I look at my account, I see sin, 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 sin. But when God looks at my life, He sees declared righteous, paid for. Jesus Christ paid for my sin. We also are heirs. There's an inheritance waiting for us. In John 14, Jesus said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Whenever I get it ready, what am I going to do? I'm going to come back again. I'm going to receive you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. I have a home waiting for me that's being prepared for me that one day I will get to enjoy. And then there's the new body that's waiting for me. One that doesn't have aches and pains. One that doesn't have congestion and cough. One that will never wear out, will never decay. That's waiting for me. I have an inheritance that's waiting for me because I've put my faith in Jesus Christ and I get eternal life, that eternal relationship that begins at the moment you believe in Christ. And many people, we live our lives thinking about our eternal life and that it's in the future. But the truth is, at the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have eternal life right then. And so we need to be living out that eternal life right here, right now. Because the way we live out our lives here and now does have an effect on our future. Not where we'll spend our future, but how we'll spend our future. So those are just three great benefits that we receive because we've put our faith in Jesus Christ. There are many more. We get spiritual gifts. We get the empowerment of the Holy Spirit which allows us to do good deeds. There are many other things, but these are the three that he speaks of that the Holy Spirit does or that we get because of the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if we don't do good deeds in order to be saved and we don't do good deeds in order to stay saved, and if I've already got eternal life, I get to be with Jesus Christ forever, then why should I do good deeds? That's many people's question. And he goes on and answers that in verse 8. Look with me at verse 8. He says, this is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want to speak to you confidently, so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. He says this is a trustworthy statement. It goes back to what he just said. That we're not saved by our good deeds done in righteousness. We're saved by the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because of God's grace, love, and mercy. 
Then he says, so that, another purpose statement, so that those who have believed God, those who believe the promise of God. Titus starts off this book, this letter to Titus. In chapter 1, verse 2, he says, in the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised long ages ago. Our eternal destiny is not based on our good deeds done in righteousness. Our eternal destiny is based on the promise that God made, and that was eternal life, and that was made long ages ago. So that those who have believed God, those who are the church, those who have eternal life, will be careful to engage in good deeds. Why? He goes on to say, these things are good and profitable for men. Notice what he does not say. He doesn't say so that you can know you're saved or so that you can stay saved. He says, because these things are good and profitable for men. He's actually said the opposite of that statement right there, he said that we're not saved by our deeds which are done in righteousness. He's also said that when one of the benefits you receive is eternal life. And if eternal life is eternal, like the by definition it is, it's eternal, it goes on forever, then it can't be based on us. It's based on that promise, the promise of God. So we are to do good deeds because they're good and profitable for men. How are they profitable? Well, I think number one is when you do good deeds for others, it helps your testimony before the world. He even exhorts Titus to this in chapter 2. In verses 7 and 8, he says, In all things, show yourself. And he's talking to Titus. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach. So the opponent will be put to shame having nothing bad to say about you. You know, many times our lifestyles don't match up with our doctrine. But that's the way we are to live our lives. We're to live godly lives that match the doctrine that we teach. Many people don't care what you say until they see that you care. So we do good deeds in order to show people that we care about them. So that whenever we speak the words, the good news message to them, they will listen. They will pay attention. So it's important for us to do good deeds. The greatest good deed that we can do for those who are unbelievers in this world is to give them the message of the gospel, to give them the true message, not a message of good deeds or good works. Do good and God will love you. We give them a good news message, the message of Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection, and how whoever believes in him has everlasting life. The second thing we need to do is we need to do good deeds within the body because it helps the body to function and grow. We are to do good deeds within this body. Whenever we come in here, we are to do service. We are to do ministry. We are to be discipling one another. It's not about coming in on a Sunday morning, finding your place, listening, singing a few songs, listening to the teaching of the day, and heading back out. We are to do ministry within the body. He's been talking about that in chapter 2 as well. He says, what are the older to be doing? The older are to be discipling the younger. We have responsibilities. If we have knowledge and information of God's word, we are to be passing it on to others. So the question is, who are you discipling? Do you have someone that you're training? Just as Paul did with Titus. Someone who you're teaching truths and principles of God's Word. But not only that, but that you're living life with. That you are showing them how to do ministry. How to take and share the gospel with other people. So that they'll be ready and you can turn them loose and go look for somebody else. Because they've got the information. They're moving on in their lives. Well, the last and final thing is as believers, our good deeds do count. Not for eternal life, but for eternal rewards. We've been seeing that in the grow groups on Sunday mornings. We've already had three lessons on it. We've got a couple left. But our good deeds, the way we live in this life, does have a determining factor on how we'll live for all eternity. Not where we'll live, because that's by faith in Christ, but how we'll live. 
our places of responsibility, the crowns that we will receive is based on how we live in this life. Doing good deeds count. As we look at this passage, we see that Titus' exhortation for these believers shows that, godly be, that right belief does not automatically lead to godly behavior. He even tells them in Titus 3.14, he says, Our people must learn to engage in good deeds, to meet the pressing needs, so that they will not be unfruitful. Dr. Tom Constable states that Paul's strong exhortation for believers to maintain good works indicates that he believed it was possible for genuine Christians not to maintain good works. Our people, the church, must learn to engage in good deeds. Not once you're saved, this is automatic. God saves us for the purpose of doing good deeds, but He doesn't make us. He doesn't force us to do good deeds. We have to make a determination. We have to decide that that's how we're going to live our lives. That's why Paul is going through this, and he is telling Titus to exhort, to reprove with all authority. He wouldn't have to remind the church if it was automatic. But we need to understand the truth from God's Word. That those of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are left here to do good deeds. We are left here to share the gospel. And so, the question is, are we living godly lives and sharing our faith? Are we living as examples of Jesus Christ? Paul said of his life, you imitate me as I imitate Christ. Are we living in such a way that we can say that as well? Are we sharing our faith? Whenever we do good deeds for other people, are we looking for the opportunity to turn around and to give them the message of why we did good deeds for them? Are we doing good deeds within this local body? Do you have places of ministry, places that you serve? That's what we're here for. We're a body of Christ. We each and every one of us have different gifts, talents, and abilities, and we use them so that the body will function. Are we gaining eternal rewards? Are you living your life not for today, but are you living your life for eternity? Whenever one day we know that we'll all stand before Him, each and every one of us individually, it's not based on what grandma did, what mom did, what my brother does. It's based on what did I do while I was here? And we're going to stand before Him. And are we going to be ashamed at His coming? Or are we going to hear Him say, well done, good and faithful servant? It's based on the deeds that we do in this life. So what have we seen this morning? We have seen that salvation is not of us. It's not based on our goodness, our righteousness. But it's based on the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's based on His grace, His love, and His mercy. But we, as people who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are to do good deeds. So let's think about some applications. Number one is let's understand God's plan of salvation. It's not by our good deeds that we've done in righteousness. We're not saved by our work, by the things that we do. We're saved because of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God the Father is the Savior in that He sent the Son. The Holy Spirit, He washes us. He regenerates us. He renews us to a new life. And Jesus Christ did the good deed it took in order for us to have everlasting life. He bore in His body our sins on the cross. That's what we are to be talking to other people about. So let's go out into this world and let's do good deeds. Let's be examples to unbelievers of that we are different than the world. Let's let them see us as different from the world. Not different from the world in that we're legalistic, but different in the world that we're gracious. We understand God's grace, love, and mercy, and let's share it with other people. Within the body, let's find a place of service, a place of ministry. Whether it be in the greeter ministry, whether it be helping in the nursery, whether it be teaching in the children's church, whether it be helping with the youth or the college, let's take our gifts, talents, and abilities and let's serve this body of Christ. And then finally, let's live for eternity. Not living for today, not living for a new house, a new car, a new iPhone, 
Let's live for eternity. The things that go on forever are God, His Word, and people. Let's invest in those three things. Let's get into God. Let's understand Him more and more by getting into His Word and understanding the truths and principles that are found there. And then let's invest in the lives of people. As believers, let's live godly lives, being ready for every good deed while we're left here in this lost and fallen world. Not to be saved, but because we are saved, because of God's grace, love, and mercy, and because of our understanding of that, let's do good deeds in this world.